Hi, this is a video about me whining about the shortcomings of a block game for an hour. I also go over some good alternatives and technical details on making your own at these timestamps, but I'd recommend you watch the full video so everything flows together nicely. Now, despite all my videos being on TF2, it should be no surprise that I've also played Minecraft. Everyone's played Minecraft, or at least 10% of everyone has. Even just the bedrock of Java sales account for 2% of the globe, with many more having heard of the game. Unfortunately, if you've heard of the game, then you've likely also heard of the recent streak of bad moves by Mojang and Microsoft. Survival has slowly gotten stale for me, the last few updates show a pattern of over-promising and under-delivering, and it seems the only response to the community nickname Mild Update was to do everything possible to bring it from just mild to completely crap. Not just that, but the- Uh-oh, I said the crap word, which is somehow a swear net. Well, sh Yes, you can get banned from all of multiplayer for saying stuff Mojang doesn't like on a server they don't even own. While they say this is only for the worst offenses of their vague rules, I'll go into more detail on why this is still dumb later. Besides, they also said the Java to Microsoft account migrations were just for security, and look how that turned out. Speaking of the migrations, I stopped playing shortly before they became mandatory, and knowing the recent updates, I don't plan on migrating anytime soon, if ever. Thus, gameplay footage will be taken from just about everything I can find except Minecraft because I am very stubborn. Also, while some videos I've seen on this may say Minecraft is dying, I think it's going to take a lot more than this to kill the most popular game on the planet. However, I feel it might be risking the loss of a core part of its veteran player base. At least if a sample size of me is concerned, just look at my desktop picture. So, where did Minecraft go wrong? Are the new chat reports as bad as they seem? Are the current alternatives to Minecraft any good? And while I'm being critical, could I put my coding skills where my mouth is and make a better game, or at least teach others how to do so? This is me whining about Minecraft, I guess, because what's being a fan of something if you can't acknowledge its flaws? Starting with my most subjective gripe, I feel that some parts of the recent updates have been a bit directionless and have made survival gameplay kind of dull. In order to distinguish survival actually getting easier from me just getting better at it over time, I'll try to go over the specific changes that made it this way. Now, pinpointing where survival started to decline would be hard, so I'll just start at 1.9 due to its contentiousness. It added dual wielding, end cities, and community splitting combat changes that I personally wouldn't mind if not for shields. While the change from spam clicking to timed attacks as a side grade, the shield's ability to block all frontal damage for one iron makes both PvP and PvE kind of dull. Likewise, the mendic enchantment is such a direct upgrade that it's practically mandatory even today, and at the time it could only be found from chests or villagers. With chests, you have to raid a lot of end cities to get non-cursed bending gear, and those practically shower you with endgame items. While end cities can be fun to raid and were definitely novel at the time, the same is not true for how you get mending on the items that don't come in end cities. Desert temples are by far the easiest way to find rare loot like this, yet each chest has a slightly less than a 1% chance to contain a mending book as of 1.9, with this chance decreasing as more enchantments are added that this book could randomly choose to be instead. Since raiding temples isn't even remotely challenging if you know where the one trap spawns and a single mending villager can give you all the books you need, villager farming became an essential part of the progression. Also, this is the update where trapping mobs by just placing a boat at them was added, making PvE even easier. Overall, I don't think 1.9 was as bad as a lot of the community seems to think it was, though it did sow the seeds for future problems, especially when 1.11 came. 1.11 mostly added Woodland Mansions, which somewhat fixed the shield meta with the Totem of Undying, a rare new item to consider putting in your offhand. I should clarify that unlike Mending, I found the rarity of a Totem or God Apple fine for a few reasons. The Totem is a side grade to the shield as it takes up the offhand, and a Gapple actually provides a pretty minor boost compared to how far you have to go to get another if you consume it, so it's nowhere near necessary. If you're skilled enough, you might not ever need to consume these items anyway, so you mostly don't even need to get them. Plus, if you want a Totem, there's a way to find it without just getting lucky, though unfortunately it also relies on villagers. Regardless, raiding mansions is pretty fun. However, 1.11 also added using fireworks for practically infinite elixir flight, turning a lot of the exploration into just waiting to finish flying over everything, which is then made necessary by the rarity of the mansions. While the punch bow trick existed before this and shares the same problem, it clearly wasn't intentional, though at least it is a bit more skill-based. There's definitely a reason that while exploration-based games I know will give you many mobility tools, like in Breath of the Wild where you almost start with an Elytra, they usually have a strict limit on full-on flight. Yes, I'm well aware you could use stasis or bomb launches to fly over everything in that game, but those mechanics clearly aren't intentional either, so they get a pass. Anyway, because the Elytra and fireworks aren't really that hard to get, and could even be less effort than setting up minecart rails or finding a horse and saddle, this also made both of those methods of transportation obsolete, and horses already made minecarts obsolete. 
This is likely why most SMP servers disable Elytras. 1.12 added parrots, more colored blocks, and a big crafting clearer for new players, which are all decent changes. Unfortunately, parrots ate chocolate cookies, which are poisonous to them in real life, so Mojang was faced with a choice. Should they prioritize realism in case little Timmy thinks real life works exactly like the game, or should they prioritize gameplay in this game? Naturally, they made cookies instantly kill them. While I can sort of see the reasoning behind this, I personally disagree with it. I get that some kids can be dumb sometimes, but if Mojang was so concerned, they could have just added a disclaimer saying not to treat anything in the game as reality, rather than making the gameplay worse to teach little kids a lesson. 1.13 added lots of aquatic improvements and continued the trend of environmentalism by adding dolphins and turtles with no useful drops so you don't kill them, and not adding sharks because- There's two reasons why we can't add the shark. Number one, because a lot of shark are endangered, and part of the reason they're endangered is because they're misunderstood. Number two is that we don't want to encourage people to A, go up to sharks, or B, um, ride, or try, you know, not necessarily ride sharks, but try to get close to sharks, or C, kill sharks in real life. So, as we all remember what happened with cookies and parrots. They're endangered and little Timmy might try to punch them in real life. Yes, that's actually the reason. In other news, Timmy died after breaking his hand on a tree, getting bowled by wolves after trying to use the broken hand bone to tame one, and jumping off a tall cliff into water while trying to escape the wolves because water isn't a catch-all solution to real-life fall damage. In comparison, let's look at how another fun sandbox game has handled this situation. I don't know about you, but I know which one sounds more fun. This update also added phantoms that basically nobody likes, starting a trend of mob votes where you're barely given any information about the mob you're voting for, and continuing a trend of never removing anything from the game even if everybody hates it. Also, doesn't using Twitter for mob votes open them up to people with no life using a bunch of alts for multiple votes, people without Twitter not being able to vote at all, and people without Minecraft casting troll votes knowing they don't have to put up with the results? It seems it would be a lot more convenient to just put a voting section on the Minecraft launcher. Just saying. 1.14 changed some textures, improved villages, though personally I think the use of trapdoors could be toned down, and slowed the game to a crawl for many. Luckily my computer could keep up, though the recent optimization problems are something I'll talk about after getting through the updates. Now as for the village changes, these did a dangerous thing for the survival meta. While they were a somewhat necessary step before due to mending, now villagers can give you almost everything else. They are one of, if not the easiest source of, diamond gear, enchants, name tags, food, saddles, arrows, XP, and explorer maps, and they are required for both iron farms and the newly available totem of a dying farm thanks to raids, so those explorer maps I mentioned are now obsolete. Now there is basically only one meta, and it is the bed cube. Also, if you are wondering why some SMP servers disallow villagers, this is why. Mining isn't even a good way of getting resources in Minecraft anymore, since the few diamonds you need for a jukebox at a chanting table are better found in shipwrecks. 1.16 added many nether features, almost all of which were actually quite fun to play with. Good job. A bit after 1.16, however, Mojang and Microsoft decided to use Minecraft as a platform for their activism, or more pessimistically, just gaming their ESG scores. And while previously they were occasionally prioritizing pseudo-environmentalism over gameplay, this time they were going into politics. Their first brave and revolutionary message? Racism bad. Now while yes, racism bad, telling everyone not to be racist is like telling them not to kick puppies. The only thing it's going to accomplish is make people wonder whether you actually do kick puppies and are just trying to hide it, and it's definitely not going to convince the type of person who actually does kick puppies. Basically, this is done either out of naivety or disingenuity, and accomplishes about as much as a company making their logo rainbow, which is to say nothing. Even assuming Mojang has good intentions that are just being naive here, I don't think real-world politics has much place in a block game, and besides, there's better places out there for doing any non-pretend political activism. Lastly, the Caves and Cliffs trilogy of updates increase the world height, add taller mountains, and give the caves a much-needed refresh while providing almost no gameplay incentive to actually use the new caves. Now I get programming can be hard sometimes, but these updates consistently overpromised and underdelivered, with 1.17 features being pushed to 1.18 to 1.19 and now beyond, and what the gameplay motivates players to do in the updates is also a bit strange. The larger caves on Hearts of Mine Deep Slate seem to discourage strip mining, which seems reasonable as strip mining is pretty boring, however ore spawn rates are greatly reduced when exposed to air, which seem to do the opposite, and the village meta is ever-present, making mining almost as pointless as it was ever since 1.14. 
Now, while Terraria gives a great example of caves where exploration is untoldly interesting but heavily encouraged, I've already used Terraria in this video, so I'm going to give a more personal example. See, being a programmer who hosts and plays on Minecraft servers for my friends, it should be no surprise that I've also made Minecraft plugins. For those who don't know what a plugin is, it's basically a mod for the server. Meaning players don't need to install anything, but you are limited to only changing server-side things, like world generation and mob AI. One of the major features of my plugin was my attempt at making mining more relevant, which I released around Minecraft 1.12. By strip mining or exploring diamond level caves for a bit, you could find a rare vertical cave that peers straight through bedrock, enticing you with a much more interesting way of mining. Jumping in would take you to the deep caves, a dimension of massive caves that go all the way to the height limit. The dark open spaces combined with custom mob spawning code made getting surrounded easy, but ore generation was also reworked to spawn in massive veins here, easily exposed by those same open spaces to discourage strip mining. Mobs spawn more the deeper you go, but so do ores, finally culminating at the underside where the stone drops off to an exposed void for maximum risk and maximum reward. Finally, to keep the caves renewable and to allow me to keep updating the generation without stark chunk borders, a dimension-wide cave-in would occur every run to three real-life days, or whenever the plugin was detected to be updated, that regenerated the caves with a new seed. For those inside, the damaged layer would rise through the whole world, forcing them to escape within 15 minutes. Since the overworld could only be reached through a bedrock hole, this would encourage running back through the caves rather than mining up and out. Now, while a dimension like this would definitely feel on a place in vanilla Minecraft, and my opinions on a plugin I made are obviously biased, I feel the way I implemented it is pretty similar to how Minecraft's best features are implemented, as a fun new option to get the resources you need, and also as an actual challenge for those with endgame gear. It's definitely not necessary unless you want stacks of jukeboxes, and 1.14 even made me buff parts of it further just to keep up with going to a village and making a bed cube. The plugin also added both entity stacking and a gun that shot breeding items called the Baby Boomer, so farming was less annoying, and most animal farms would still barely keep up with a few butchers. Honestly, a lot of my issues are just cumulative from 1.14. Speaking about 1.14, remember fletching tables? Because 1.19 decided to add some new items to the neglected features list. Archaeology, followed logs, birch forests, I know concept art doesn't equal a commitment, but come on, that should have been made initially clear. Firefly. Mojang's animal activism also makes a guest appearance once more when they decided to remove fireflies because they are poisonous to frogs in real life. At this point, I think the removal of fireflies matters way less than the ridiculous reason that they were removed. With all the problems of the previous updates building up, combined with how these updates were handled, and likely also with me just getting bored of survival, 1.17 is about when I stopped playing Minecraft. What's worse, many people with lower-end hardware reported another massive performance hit after switching to 1.18, much like the 1.14 hit that practically forced Mojang to make 1.15 a bug fix and performance update. Speaking of 1.15 and 1.10, I didn't mention them in this list because I don't actually have any qualms with them. They were both minor updates, but they weren't hyped up to be anything more than that, and the few features they did add were pretty decent in my opinion. 1.15 even shows an example of Mojang listening to the community and adding a new feature because of it, with honey blocks not sticking to slime blocks. So, now that we've seen why I think survival has gotten stale, let's focus on how all these updates have led to recent versions of Minecraft being so unoptimized to the point where many servers have stayed in earlier versions, and how those performance issues may be able to get fixed. If you've played or heard of modern Minecraft Java, you'd know of its many optimization problems. First off, it's made in the Java programming language, which is not the most optimized language to begin with, and to explain why will require a brief introduction to why programming languages were made in the first place. You see, a computer can only run code and a specific set of instructions defined in and by its hardware. Here's some examples of what these hardware instructions look like. They're about as complex as the instructions I made for my TF2 calculator, but implemented in hardware. This way of programming is so bare-bones it doesn't even have variables like basically every other language would. Instead, you must manage allocating and storing values in parts of the computer's memory yourself. Anyway, every programmer anywhere unanimously decided this sucks and so programming languages are a thing now. But these languages also need a program that translates the code into machine instructions for the type of hardware it can run on. If this program converts the code before running it and distributes the machine instructions as the application, it is a compiler and that programming language is a compiled language. If this program converts the code while it's running, it is an interpreter and that language is an interpreted language. Some programming languages, like Java, compile the code to an intermediate language that isn't programmed in but is faster for an interpreter program to interpret. 
effectively offloading some of the processing work to when the program is being compiled, while not having to compile your program for every type of computer you want it to run on like you would with a compiled language. All you need is for the people who made Java to have compiled their interpreter program, which they call a JVM, for the type of computer you want, and for that computer to have the JVM installed. Yes, I know the JVM also compiles some parts of the code depending on how often that code is ran, but that's not important for this. Because of the extra work done by the interpreter, a programming language generally gets faster the more compiled it is due to offloading this work to when the program was compiled, and Java is in the middle of this spectrum. Now, as impressive as the inner workings of the JVM may be, its existence at all means it won't be as fast as a fully compiled language like C, C++, or Rust. Especially considering Java isn't as good at memory management and garbage collection than these languages, and storing all those blocks is going to take up a lot of memory, Java definitely isn't the best choice for this kind of game. Combine that with an underlying codebase that was never made to get as many updates as it did, and you've got an optimization disaster. Especially considering that any major rewrites of Minecraft Java would need to preserve so many redstone glitches turned features, else risk a major community backlash. So now you may be thinking, maybe it'd just be better to rewrite Minecraft anyway, despite the backlash. Maybe this time it would be optimized and using better tools for the job, like C++. Years ago, Mojang also thought of this, making Minecraft Bedrock Edition. As expected, it has fundamentally different redstone and quite a few other differences, but it is certainly faster. So why does the player base seem to heavily favor Java over Bedrock then? Well, Bedrock may have fared better with the community if not for its near constant mismanagement. Minecraft Bedrock should have been a clean slate, and while Java has more bugs, the bugs Bedrock had on launch, and mostly still has, are way more detrimental. You can fall through the world at specific coordinates, die for seemingly no reason, or have supposedly persistent entities disappear on you. In addition, there's still many rounding errors in rendering that occur within the standard play area of 30 million blocks from spawn, which could be fixed as simply as making some of their floating point variables more precise, such as by using doubles, which due to type defs in C++ should only be difficult if the game was coded poorly. Thankfully, most players don't experience these bugs, so they're not as bad as I've so far made them out to be, but one thing was soon added that every Bedrock player would have to put up with. The Marketplace. It has emotes, it has shameless cash grabs, it has a virtual currency called Minecoins. Everything you need to make Bedrock look like a parody showing what Minecraft would be like if it was run like mobile games. Short of all the advertisements about reaching pink color, of course. One thing I find is especially surprising is that Marketplace creators need to partner with Mojang, yet there's still no quality control from Mojang whatsoever, not to mention that mods, resource packs, and skins are completely free on Java anyway. Not just frequently labeled bitter for disliking modern Minecraft, but if you had a game that up until you sold it went in the exact direction you wanted and it now is being treated like this, I wouldn't blame him for thinking the game's spirit is dead. As a quick side note, despite him mostly being known for baking Minecraft, during my research I also found he makes music, and it's actually pretty good. He seems like at the very least an interesting person to talk to, even if not about Minecraft, since I bet he'd be pretty sick of talking about Minecraft regardless. Anyway, that's not all we've seen of Minecraft Bedrock's mismanagement. The chat reporting in Java that everyone likely knows about already has actually been present in Bedrock for a while, and there's already quite a few horror stories about it. From the mandatory swear filter being set off by the default Minecraft item names, to people getting shadow muted or banned just from saying stuff in single player, there's a lot to talk about. Enough, in fact, for it to be the next part of this video. For most of Bedrock Edition and in the Java 1.92.1 snapshots, Mojang has implemented some ways to globally censor the in-game chat. The first of which is an automatic swear filter, which they somehow managed the program in the worst way imaginable. To demonstrate, let's say speedrunning suddenly became offensive and strat, short term of strategy, is now a swear. The most naive way to censor this would be to search for exact matches of the text, but now we've just locked ourselves into the best word of the dictionary, among a few others. This is the Scunthorpe problem, named after a town with a very unfortunate name. Luckily, they've recently improved it to only test for if the whole word matches the swear, but now you can just add an extra letter to the end of the swear to bypass the filter entirely. Not to mention, you can just use late speak to get around both versions of the filter, so we'll need a new filter entry for every possible way to make each swear. For just letter replacements, the amount of combinations is equal to the number of ways to make each letter all multiplied together. Considering how many characters even look sort of similar from the wide array to choose from in the Unicode standard, we get... a lot. So either we barely catch any letter substitutions, or you have a swear list that takes up several gigabytes per swear. 
Yet this is the system Mojang chose, with a swear list that censors a night because it includes a small part of an actual swear, and ten repeats of the F word which is increasingly more used that can still be beaten by just adding an extra C. Now, something I once thought was relatively common programming knowledge is regular expressions, which is basically this but with macros, such as match any of these characters, match even if this character group is repeated multiple times, and at least make sure it's not in the middle of the word for god's sakes. This, combined with a robust list of filters, is how you'd actually censor swears, and if you thought of it before I said it, then consider yourself smarter than a Mojang employee. This too has problems, however. What if someone wanted to go to the Strat Hotel, or play a Strat guitar? Sometimes a swear can just appear as a full word and still not be a swear. And according to this humorous example by Phoenix XC, this sometimes makes it worse. So let's say we just censor the whole chat. Surely nobody can do anything offensive now in this game about building anything. Clearly automated filters won't work, but what about Mojang's new player reported and human reviewed chat reporting system that comes included in the save updates? Well, you could be banned from all of multiplayer if found guilty, not to mention they couldn't even get the programming right for this feature, letting you spoof parts of conversations if you know what you're doing, which people have already made mods to do! See, in updates with chat reporting, message data comes with a number called a public key, calculated from the message data and an account-specific private key. Using math operations that are much harder to calculate in one direction than the other, it's easy to tell whether a certain public key is valid, though finding your private key from a public key it created would have to rely on guessing, which would likely take eons with a long enough key. Since the public key changes depending on what message it's signing, the ability to sign a specific message with your key could prove that it is you that sent it. Many secure systems already use this for authentication by sending client devices a random number which they must generate the valid public key for, so what's the problem? Well, each chat message, who sent it, the time it was sent, and the public key corresponding to that data is sent to your computer, the client. When reporting, Mojang normally receives data about any messages in question and a few previous messages for context, but with mods, you could send Mojang anything. While we can't generate the key to fabricate other people's messages, we can omit messages, and nothing's stopping you from making up a message sent from you. Turning a rant about phantoms into a clear-cut case of racism, or some helpful advice into some despicable bullying. Sure, these examples were specifically made to prove a point, but with so many servers and so many people doing a little trolling, they can definitely happen. Especially considering that by working together, a group of trolls could even amalgamate chat logs from multiple servers. Picking and choosing from several conversations and just pretending they were all from the same chat, because who's gonna tell that they weren't? Now let's say you still think global chat reporting could be fine if implemented correctly, and I- Let me tell you the story of the- Oh no! What's this? Why, it's actual Discord messages I sent when a friend and I found out that making the TTS command say terrible things is really funny, and now it's the background music for this part of the video. See, if you were listening to this without knowing the context, you'd probably be anywhere from confused to horrified, but now it's funny. Even if someone was still offended by this, they could just leave the server. And if you think this wouldn't get banned if I said it on a private 1.19 Minecraft server and someone reported it, then I think you're just wrong. Mojang says the global multiplayer bans are only for the worst offenses, and not just for swearing or being moderately edgy, yet there's a few reasons I'm less than inclined to believe them. Different human moderators will have much different thresholds for a bannable offense, and some categories like hate speech, exploits, and spam are incredibly vague, especially considering many redstone mechanics used to be exploits. For my last piece of evidence, I remind you that Bedrock Edition has had this feature for just a few years, and there's already numerous accounts of it not working. From people getting banned for no reason, to suspensions for writing naughty words on signs and books and not just private realm servers, but single player as well. If the banned player isn't even told what they did wrong half the time, how are they supposed to improve or even appeal? Considering some of those likely weren't even reported by anyone, especially the ones on single player, there is a good chance that Bedrock already moved a lot of this from human reported and reviewed to automatically doing either, or both, and why wouldn't they? This is the biggest video game in human history, you can't just hire a few guys to keep up with the flood of chat messages from millions of players, and surely someone at Mojang has to know this. I really want to hope that Mojang is doing all this with the best of intentions, but there is no doubt that they're going about it completely wrong. Legally speaking, I'm pretty sure most countries do allow Mojang to revoke an account's privileges for any reason, as stated in their terms and conditions, though some countries have more consumer protection laws that might actually make this illegal there. I'm not a lawyer though, so I could be wrong about this. 
Morally speaking, however, it is my opinion that they have no right to police what is said and done on a private server under the guise of protected kids that won't ever even join it, especially considering the average Minecraft player is 24. Minecraft isn't just a kid's game. So if they think that just because someone somewhere may be offended if they ever saw what name you gave to an item on a private server or single player world that they could prevent you from doing so, then I say how dare they, because frankly I'm a bit offended that an idea this stupid even made it into production. Besides, they have an update they should be working on, it's no wonder they're behind on features if they're putting so much effort into stuff like this. I'll say, what's that? Oh, it's the Minecraft trailer. No one can tell you what you can or cannot do. With no rules to follow. This adventure, it's up to you. Ooh, looks like Mojang should probably update that. Now if you're like me and you're either getting bored of Minecraft's lackluster updates or just don't like Mojang's more recent direction, you may be wondering about alternatives, or at least a way to motivate Mojang and Microsoft to improve their game. Personally, I believe the best way to get a company to do better is with a healthy dose of competition, so for the final part of this video, I'll be going over a few free Minecraft competitors you could play right now, how to program a Minecraft-inspired slash cloned game of your own, and the potential development of my own project. After all, this way either someone makes an improved version of Minecraft, or Minecraft itself will improve. It's a win-win. In particular, a really good Minecraft competitor that also happens to be free, open source, and thus is also really easy to mod is MineTest, the only thing non-Minecraft with either mine or craft in a title that isn't just a shameless cash grab. Hi, while editing this video, another video almost certainly talking about mind test was brought to my attention from my recommended feed. While it's great that more attention is being brought to mind test, this video is both popular and slightly before mine, so someone will undoubtedly think I copied him. I didn't, I've known about mind test for years, and I couldn't have copied him this fast even if I wanted to since my video took about a month to put together. I even made sure not to watch his video so I wouldn't subconsciously copy it, not that I watch his stuff much anyway since the few videos I saw a few years ago seemed to be really padded for time. Breaking Minecraft. What? Unbridled chaos unexplainable chaos crazy chaos i don't know what to say here i've got nothing i've got nothing we can just stand still and try and come up with a reason for all of this but reason went out the window a long time ago there isn't even a word to describe it anymore the english language isn't sufficient enough to quantify this level of broken minecraft loading point rounding errors i just compressed like half of his videos into less than a second for a slightly more verbose explanation, more digits in a number takes up more space on a computer like it would on a page, so really big or small numbers are stored with floating point, which is akin to storing a number in scientific notation with an exponent in mantissa. This means float calculations lose accuracy with bigger numbers due to rounding, which is perfectly normal behavior for any value stored using a float, though if it's noticeable within the bounds of normal gameplay, then that's on the game's devs who at the very least should have used doubles. You didn't break anything by making a number big, that's just how floating point works. And maybe these videos are floating point because they're sure big and inaccurate, and Mant is a lot of clickbait. He might be better now, I hope he's better now, but I haven't checked. Anyway, back to the video. I did not copy him. I did not. It's a game engine, meaning numerous games and mods are built off of it, it's thankfully not written in Java, and it has cubic chunks built in. Admittedly, it's not perfect, mob AI is poorly optimized, the world size is but a 64 kilometer cube, and as a side effect of easy modding, there's a bit of... Uh... Mine mud for ores, probabilistically, in space? Can I sort through the garbage to find what's good? While I'm playing every game in the engine that even looks sort of like Minecraft, and then showing how easy it is to spice up the best ones even more with mods, so you can find out in this mostly unscripted segment, starting with... Minecast Game is the default game in the engine, which is intentionally bare-bones so it can be a base to mod other games out of, though this may scare off new players who think this is all there is. I played it for a bit, mostly to explore the terrain generation and see what I could find, and my verdict? The terrain and blocks are actually pretty nice. It does have some oddities, like bug blocks, or the fact that flowers lack most placement restrictions, but overall it was fun. One thing I quickly found, however, is that this game lacks bobs of any kind, and running around in an empty world can only get you so far. So I quickly switched to another game in the engine. After all, there are many more experiences to be had in this game engine, and downloading new games and mods is really easy due to the fact that it can be done in-game. Mine Clone 2 is a pretty faithful Minecraft clone that adds almost everything up to 1.12 with surprising accuracy, but for this video I played Mine Clone 5, which adds things from later Minecraft versions but with less testing resulting in more bugs. First off, it has bobs. Neat. Their spawning is a bit messed up, but basically every mob as of 1.17 is present. 
There's a few other oddities, of course, but other than that, it's basically Minecraft, with all of vanilla Minecraft's ups and downs, though the villagers are pre-1.14, which if anything is an improvement. Seems boats are faster now, thankfully. Also, if those are mine shafts, then I think someone really needs to tone down their spawn rate. Is that a jungle temple in a savanna? Is that a jungle temple in a plains biome? The visuals are a bit unpolished, but I think they look nice, and it shouldn't be too difficult to mod Minecraft's music, sound, spawn, dead textures back in if you want. As one of the most popular mind test games, a lot of mods are made either for it or to be compatible with it, so that's also an extra plus. On a scale of no fun at all to Minecraft as I left it, so slightly before the censorship and chat reporting, I think I might actually rate it a full 100%, since the pre-1.14 villagers and passive mod spawning present enough to not need a big farm offset the features it's missing from Minecraft, at least in a survival context, even if those features are technically unintended. The height limit is also much higher than Minecraft's could ever hope to be, just because of the engine it uses. I guess this means the nether is implemented. <laughs> Voxel Garden starts off strong with several bangers for its menu themes, so I can't wait to see what it doesn't work. And so does Carbon NG, A Planet Alive, and Worst Block Game, which judging by the name, that one may have been a blessing. The menu themes are still really good though, so I'm just gonna keep using them. I then ended up having a streak of games that, while at least decent in their own right, certainly don't play like Minecraft. I didn't play much of them, and won't rank them, but I'll mention them here for completeness. Exile seems like if Don't Starve was a voxel game where you're meant to build a small shelter and survive through various weather cycles, but instead I decided to explore while waiting to see if there were any hostile mobs in the night. The terrain wasn't too interesting, and the only danger of the night was a low temperature, but I did find this. Well, guess I can see what's down here. Oh, it's the dropper! Uh... Why does this exist? Other notable features I found include punchable chickens, randomly generated crimes, and not much else because I didn't play it for very long. Next up is Nodecore, which makes up for its lack of interesting terrain, mobs, or even an inventory by having lots of complex voxel interactions, to the point where you don't even need an inventory because you can do crafting just by arranging voxels in a specific way. Everything is placeable, instead of losing health or dying, you just drop hotbar slots, and I got stuck in a canyon early on but just swam with a lava hole to get out because I can't die. While I didn't play these games for long since they're not the best Minecraft replacements, I'd recommend you try them out anyway if you find their concepts interesting, and I may even do a longer playthrough of them in a later video. For now though, it's time for... Real Test marked the start of a few games that focused more on survival, but less so than Exile, meaning they may still play close to Minecraft. Apparently it's a game from 2012 made to work with recent versions of Mind Test, which may be why it didn't seem to include very much. It doesn't appear to have much to explore, and at least in the early game it seems a bit annoying to craft each part of a tool separately. While waiting for the night to see if there were mobs, I managed to get some basic tools and walk around, but not much else. Oh. How is this fire starter not starting any fires? What? Unfortunately, there were no mobs. Not even passive ones, which becomes a recurring theme for some of the games. With no mobs comes no challenge, unless the game is like Exile or Nodecore, and if the game lacks challenge, then it better have amazing exploration or building mechanics, because otherwise I likely won't be playing it for very long. The next game on my list was K-Survive 2, a game seemingly in its early alpha stages, so here's some gameplay of that. The textures really don't look very good. I don't have the sound muted. As it turns out, when looking for a suitable Minecraft replacement, not constantly roleplaying as a deaf guy is pretty high on the criteria list. I didn't even wait until Nightfall this time to immediately switch to the original K-Survive. K-Survive, however, had a slightly different problem. My initial playthroughs of each game are all mostly blind to see if the game has clear enough progression for the average newcomer, but in the in-game day I played it for, I could not figure out what I was supposed to do to get tools. What does this do? Does it kill me? Okay, oh, wait, I can't move. 
I can't progress. There also didn't seem to be any bobs, which was unfortunate. Juwanji game surprised me by actually being kind of good. It seems to be a loose collection of a bunch of mostly unrelated mods, but with fitting textures for everything to tie it all together. It has music, really nice world generation, a crafting guide, armor, no sprinting, but it does have a bicycle, which is kind of like sprinting. I mostly did some mining, which was soon expedited when I found out I could place blocks inside myself to get x-ray. Oh. Iron, probably. Oh! That's cool! Unfortunately, it doesn't seem to be any mobs in the game. Due to the many mods, there's also a few odd features that don't really fit with anything else. I'm still not sure what this even affects. Ketchup land, because when I said I was playing everything, I meant it. Oh no, this is another one with no sound. Is that... is that actual ketchup water? Did a ketchup refinery have a ketchup spill? There's no sprinting, there's cacti, there's spicy ketchup water, and there's keep inventory. Because I was in a desert and those don't have anything I needed to progress, I had to walk over to a nearby tree in a near equally inhospitable volcanic region. I then got stuck for several minutes before realizing what I had to do. Apparently, a stick counts as a tool for mining stony dirt, though I have no idea how a stick was supposed to help with that. With three small rocks, I constructed a stone pickaxe so that I could get more stone for the other tools, but unfortunately for me, I had just made a grave mistake. I had attempted to apply logic to ketchup land. Remember, stone tools are made with rocks. They are not made with stones. So there is no way to turn a stone into rocks because these are clearly two very different things. So to actually harvest the tree, I scoured the land for rocks, finding some really janky terrain generation in the process because volcanoes are apparently treated as structures. What? Now you may be wondering why I didn't just give up at this point, and that's because this game had officially crossed the stupid threshold, where what was previously annoying now becomes intriguing as I attempt to find out just how stupid it gets. Do these torches even have any placement restrictions? Okay, I guess they don't. Besides, I had another mission. Since this is ketchup land, I couldn't just leave without crafting a bucket and scooping up some cursed ketchup. After mining what was apparently cobalt and upgrading my tools, I finally found iron, but before I do that, can you find the iron in this picture? That's right, it's this texture for some reason, and despite being much harder to find than cobalt, it turns out it isn't even the better material. Anyway, after searching some other caves for more iron, and undoubtedly missing half of it anyway, I got more than enough iron to find out the buckets aren't even in this game. But at least I found an even worse texture combination. And now I've made the world's dumbest parkour. Having seen all I needed to, I jumped off a cliff and melted into the spicy ketchup, and now that I was truly one with the ketchup, I immediately left the game. I then tried voxel nights, and I'm not sure if I'm doing something wrong, but I can't do anything. Uh, next game. Now after so many games with little to no mobs, I decided to play a game that is guaranteed to have mobs, and combat. Maybe even epic combat. Supposedly as combat that is epic, and combat without anything to combat doesn't sound very epic, so clearly it must have some mobs. I quickly gathered supplies, of which there was actually a pretty wide aware to choose from, and waited for nightfall since there wasn't actually anything to combat in the day. After waiting, it was finally time to meet my first combatant, a black cube. Never mind, a black cube with reach checks. Seriously, how does it reach me from over there without arms? Luckily, I had a trick up my sleeve too. The massive amount of healing items all over the place. So I quickly fled and healed up. Next, I found some completely unanimated player models and discovered they were also practically invincible. I did find out that them being completely black was just a weird lighting thing though. With my newfound knowledge, I have managed to find out that the black cube was actually a green cube. So I killed it and it dropped some grass. For my next combatant, an ant jumped out of a nearby tree, no doubt to engage in some epic combat. I killed it almost immediately. Finally, I attempted to kill the one thing I haven't killed yet, the invincible sliding player model. I died. After testing once more to confirm that these guys really are just invincible, I left. This game does actually have some of the basics of a good Minecraft replacement, though it has absolutely zero polish and I think the monsters could use some more interesting drops. Repixture has a Terraria-like crafting system, nice textures, a few mobs, and gameplay that's a bit slow. This is actually a really cool crafting system. There isn't too much to say about it, it's not bad, but it's not spectacularly good either, and it could do with a faster mining speed.
Beastcraft, however, contains a lot more to talk about. It lacks sprinting and the mod with all the music is currently disabled by default, but other than that, the game is amazing. Pollution block. Okay, can I build them? Oh my god! For my playthrough, it had unique mobs to fight, a few structures to explore, and even some floating islands. I also checked what items and mobs were in each game with creative mode, and Beastcraft also seemed to contain the most of each. Is this what this thing's version of Creepers is supposed to be? There are some differences from Minecraft, of course, such as the fact that torches generate obscuring smoke and burn out after a bit, so you may need to get a little more creative when lighting your base. Lastly, while I didn't know what beast meant originally, I later found out it seems to be the mind test equivalent of redstone, which should be quite interesting. Here's some of the highlights of my gameplay. Actually kinda neat. Not tamed! <laughs> Why can I tame this woman? <laughs> oh. I like the knockback these things give you. Oh! Oh wait, did it just eat the... Oh, a bell. I'm trying to see if this... <laughs> Regnum seems to be a less polished 3D Terraria-like game with many tiers of progression and many enemies whose AI kinda sucks. I started as normal, mining various ores I found and getting the various presents the mobs drop, though I'm still not sure what they do. Unfortunately, the crafting guide lacks a search function, so I wasn't about to find out how this stuff works anytime soon. I also got DNA from the enemies. Anyway, I did some more mining, noticed a bunch of mob drops in the river because I kept walking off the cliff and into it. I then accidentally put coal in the top slot of my furnace, which actually worked since apparently furnaces burn hot enough to turn the coal into diamonds in this game. Now you may think that if diamonds are this easy to get, they'd be rebalanced to keep the other ores relevant, but... I then decided to dig down until the pickaxe ran out of durability. I still couldn't mine the weird boxy ores, so clearly diamond isn't the highest tier. But with all the mobs so far having the same AI, bottle, and drops that I still don't know how to use, not to mention the somewhat bland underground, I left for Regnum 2. Regnum 2 is a weird cross between a sequel to Regnum and Terraria's hard mode, since it seems it's meant to be played once you fully advance through Regnum. I started with what I can only assume to be the best tools for Regnum, making me wonder what the point was for having this be a second game rather than just adding its progression to the first. With me now having even less of an idea what to do, I decided to use the world-destroying infinite durability mining laser to dig as deep as I could. Since I haven't seen my test's world border yet, the bottom of the world seemed to be the easiest one to reach. My task was made even easier by the fact that fall damage sometimes just doesn't apply, so I mined down and down until I mined into some lava and died. Lastly, there was Za Environment, placed out of order to save the most interesting for last. Let's see what it has to offer. Oh. Okay, already off to a good start. As you can see, it immediately beat out Ketchup Land by reaching the stupid threshold almost immediately. What can't be said about Zai Environment? It has parkour, NPCs with random strings for names that insult you in chat, nukes that are easier to get than wood, Mario Odyssey 2D sections apparently, and many more. I started my playthrough after my immediate death in a jungle with several footsteps sounds that later turned out to be accurately sized bug mobs, which is why I couldn't initially see them. I had no idea how to get wood, so I entered some guy's house to see if he had any, but he didn't even have a door, so I broke in through the window. After finding several C4s and nukes for some reason, I concluded that he did have a door, it just had the exact same texture as the house and was half underground. After trying and failing repeatedly to actually use the C4 or nukes to chop down a tree, I decided to search in some other houses. Eventually, I did find something useful. The item that I had when I died was actually hung up on some guy's window, so I took it to see what it was, and apparently it was a crafting guide, which would have been very useful earlier. I then knew that I needed sticks, but I still didn't know how to get them because none of the leaves dropped them. I later found the only leaves that dropped sticks were actually these specific bushes right here. So after mining a few of those for sticks, I then ventured further to find what seemed to be a city, raised on a massive concrete platform so I couldn't even get up to it, and with what looked to be some sort of build protection so I couldn't even tower up to it. I did get a glimpse of what was up there though from the many NPCs and cars that barreled down the cliff due to their terrible pathfinding. Now one thing I didn't yet mention is that I died quite frequently during this journey, usually due to either hitting my head mid front flip or by being attacked by one of the bug mobs from earlier. This didn't affect me at all, however, because there was a set home feature that effectively let me return to exactly where I died as long as I set my home before doing so. 
After looking around a bit longer, I quickly realized that even hours of playing through this in survival probably wouldn't do this justice. So I decided to switch to creative to see what else this had to offer. Cars are popping into existence inside each other. Several times. Wait, I can buy plots of land? As you can see though, there is definitely uh, the equivalent of redstone in this game. Almost everything about this game is stupid, but all in the best ways. There's so much to do and explore, and you'll never know what you'll find. It doesn't just have sprinting, it has a fully-fledged parkour system, complete with several layers of jank. It doesn't just have mobs, it's full of them, complete with NPCs that probably pass the Turing test against some online game chats I've seen. It doesn't just have structures and interesting terrain. It has an environment. Oh, and the guy who made it also makes music, and I think it's pretty decent. Now, let's say none of these games completely appeal to you. They may have some features you like, but nothing combines them in just the right way. Fortunately, the modular nature of Mindtest means that its games are effectively mod packs for the base engine, meaning that for the most part, they're just lists of specific mods, configured in just the right way to work with each other. Even game-specific features are just added with a mod made specifically for that game, though nothing limits it to being used in just that game. This means it's really easy to mix and match features. If you find a fun game but it lacks sprinting, mobs, or music, you can add it in if you want in just a few clicks. For any programmers, I've also heard it's relatively easy to make mods in case there's anything the current mods are still missing. However, if you still aren't satisfied with my test or you just want a fun programming challenge, the next part of this video will be dedicated to showcasing the technology behind Minecraft, my test, and things like them, in the hope that it can teach you how to make your own. In this part of the video, I'll go over the technology behind voxel engines such as Mindtest or the engine behind Minecraft and show you how to make your own. For context, the term voxel stands for volume element, the 3D analog to a pixel or picture element which normally represents image data on a grid. When I refer to a voxel, it'll always be to the smallest buildable unit in the world rather than the many 3D pixels each unit likely emulates with its model or texture. Even though this may not be the most accurate term, it's much better for measuring stuff like storage efficiency and even rendering to some extent. With that out of the way, you may be wondering how all this fits into copyright laws, considering one of Mindtest's games is a pretty faithful Minecraft clone. Fortunately, copyright concerning games only applies to the code and art assets used to create it, not game mechanics. I'd still recommend making something more original than an exact clone, one already exists after all, and I might be wrong about the legal stuff anyway. As for technical stuff, which I am much less likely to be wrong about, if you want to make a voxel game with a pre-existing engine, I'd recommend using Mindtest, though if you'd want to make your own voxel engine, you'll need to decide a few things. How your voxels are stored, how they are rendered, and how they are lit. For entities, you'll also need to decide how they're rendered and stored, plus how various behaviors like collision and AI are programmed. And additional code will of course be needed if you plan on including multiplayer. I won't explain this as much since the focus of this part of the video is mainly on making a voxel engine specifically, rather than a general purpose game engine. Finally, anyone making a game engine must decide which programming language to use, and finally which code libraries to use on top of it. To start, I'd recommend C++ or Rust as performant languages, though many of the libraries I use work only with C++. While newer coders may find these languages hard, newer coders probably shouldn't start out by making a game engine anyway. Speaking of libraries, Vulkan and OpenGL are both great options for graphics, with Vulkan sacrificing ease of use for performance if you know how to use it well. And GLFW handles both the window your game draws to, and any input that window captures. For audio, I personally use the Port Audio Library. I have also found that GLM works well as a math library, though recently I've just been writing my own. Adding more libraries can save you from doing more work on your own, but if you have too many external dependencies or choose them haphazardly, that'll give you problems too. Once you've tested the libraries you're using to make sure they work, it's time to decide how you'll store your voxel data. The first choice is both the easiest to implement and the most limited by far, as it'll only work with a small fixed and rectangular world size. By multiplying each side length of the world together and making an array with that size to store each voxel, you can store each voxel in a row together, then store each row of voxels together in a 2D layer of voxels, and then store each layer together to make the 3D world. The voxel at any coordinate can now be found by multiplying each axis of the coordinate by every axis before it of the world size, then adding every axis together. The number you are left with is the index of that voxel in the data array. Because there's always only one axis, where voxels that are close to each other in the world are close together in computer memory, this storage method is not very cache efficient. Since reading and writing memory is relatively slow on modern computers, they load contiguous sections of memory, called cache lines, into a small yet fast cache, which is then read or written. For close by memory accesses, this is incredibly fast, but when a new cache line has to load for each access, it becomes much slower. Older versions of Minecraft use this flat array method, so it can work, but keep in mind that there are better methods available. 
For example, if you divide your world into small chunks of voxels, then voxels in each section will be much closer together in memory, though each chunk will still likely take up several cache lines. The main benefit of this strategy is the ability to make much larger worlds by only generating and loading the chunks around the player, though you will now need a way to store each chunk. Minecraft uses chunks ever since its infinite versions, which enabled the larger world sizes, and it stores them in a hash map, an array that contains extra data and uses special code to let you index it using anything, including a chunk coordinate. Though voxels could technically be stored in the hash map directly, this would be much slower as the extra processing needed for a hash map makes it slow to access, and storing voxels in chunks first means nearby voxels will likely only need the one hash map access. The vital storage method in this video takes advantage of the speed of accessing things within the same chunk, and is the method that I personally use. First, an array is used to store a cube of 8 voxels, with a side length of 2 voxels on each access. This is called a node in this data structure. A larger node can then be made to store pointers to the location of 8 smaller nodes in memory, unless a node contains only one type of voxel, in which case the voxel data is stored in place of a pointer. This last step is then repeated, doubling the side length of the world each time. Due to this doubling, the world can quickly become billions of voxels long while using only a few layers of nodes. In addition, nearby voxels are almost always close by in memory, and large sections of stone or air found in a typical world can usually be stored in a single node, leading to relatively small world sizes compared to other methods. This data structure is known as an octree due to each node containing 8 objects in the layer of the nodes resembling the branches of a tree. Now that I've covered storing voxels as a fixed array, in chunks, or using an octree, I will go over some ways you could improve this further. For example, since similar voxels are likely to be close to each other, a palette can be stored with each section of the world that matches numbers to a voxel type. If your palette is small enough, you can store each voxel in less than a byte. For octrees, pointers can be made smaller if you make them relative to the current node address and make careful note of how you order each node in memory. Save data can also be compressed further by discarding chunks or nodes that aren't changed from the natural generation of the world, though this strategy wouldn't apply as well to data in memory, since those parts of the world would have to be regenerated each time the voxels there are accessed. Depending on how small your voxels are, it may even be efficient to store parts of the world in other ways, like with prefabs. This applies less to Minecraft-sized voxels, but most of those are basically prefabs for various meter-sized objects anyway, so it doesn't matter very much. With that mostly covered, it's time for voxel rendering. Before I compare each method, I do want to mention the difference between render distance with LODs and the actual render distance without them. LOD stands for level of detail, meaning farther objects are drawn with much less detail. While Minecraft mods like Farplane 2, which employ this, are impressive, you can clearly see that distant terrain and especially structures can look really messed up. This is intentional, since it's only meant to seem like distant terrain is being fully rendered, and while this is enough for most purposes, I can't fairly count it for render distance comparisons. LODs can be applied to almost any rendering method to almost any degree, so render distance comparisons, including LODs, just wouldn't make much sense. Anyway, the GPU, or graphics processing unit of a computer, typically renders an object as a mess of triangles, using math to translate each vertex coordinate in the world to the coordinate on your screen before filling in the triangle's pixels with its texture. To render voxels near the player, the area is divided into small regions of voxels and a mesh is generated for each region, which is updated every time a voxel in that region changes. If you are storing your voxels in chunks, the chunks can also be used as voxel regions for rendering. Since the time it takes to render a scene increases with every triangle that must be drawn, voxel faces that are obscured by other voxels should not be included when generating this mesh. Even with this optimization, however, the game can still run slowly at large render distances due to the sheer amount of voxel faces being rendered, though this method does have the benefit of being relatively easy to implement. Most voxel engines I've seen use this method. In real life, we see things when a photon with a wavelength corresponding to an object's color is reflected from that object to our eyes. This is why one way to render an environment with very realistic results is to simulate the path those photons would have made in the game world, tracing the ray of light that would hit each pixel on the screen by starting from the camera position and working backwards to the object drawn at that pixel. Typically, ray tracing is slow because collision has to be calculated for every pixel on every frame, and checking for the collision of a line against every potentially visible triangle can take a while already. This is why ray tracing is usually reserved for rendering 3D animations, and games with ray tracing, or Minecraft ray tracing mods, require a beefy GPU to run fast. However, ray tracing can be made much faster in the context of a voxel engine, because it relies on collision and it's easy to test for collision against an AABB, or axis line bounding box, which is obviously quite common in these engines. All you have to do to test if a point is inside the box, for example, is to see if each axis of its coordinate is between the corresponding points of the box's edges. Testing when a ray hits the box can be done via the slabs test, which is done like this. 
Lastly, the voxels hit by a ray can be found without testing each voxel since they're on a grid, and if you're using an Oak tree to store the voxels, you can skip massive sections of empty voxels at a time. The only big limitation with ray tracing without triangles is that you couldn't have rotated parts of a voxel without a significant performance decrease, but I personally still use this method, since I was already going to give myself this limitation as I think it fits the voxel art style better. Besides, if the entity designs are kept relatively simple, they could probably get away with stuff like rotating and not being aligned to a voxel grid. Comparing voxel ray tracing to standard mesh rendering, mesh rendering is great for high resolutions, because filling the pixels inside a triangle doesn't take much processing power when its vertices have already been translated onto their screen positions. However, ray tracing combined with Oak trees has already been used to get impressive render distances in these voxel engines by John Lynn and Gavin Woolery because octrees could optimally skip massive sections of the world, the time to render a scene increases linearly each time the render distance doubles. This means that a graph of render time versus render distance is logarithmic, so ray tracing could be said to render most scenes in logarithmic time. Using technology like this, it wouldn't even be infeasible to make a 3D version of Noida. If my voxel engine goes well, I might even try to do so in the future. As for mesh rendering, render time increases with each triangle in the scene, and this typically increases with the render distance squared, or sometimes even cubed if the world lacks a strict height limit like the one Minecraft has. Unfortunately, ray tracing doesn't scale as well regarding resolution changes, as even slightly larger screen sizes can add millions of additional rays to trace. As for the additional features of each rendering method, complex shapes can render way better as a mesh, but the sharp triangle edges make perfect curves impossible. Ray tracing can render simple shapes easily, but this likely won't matter unless you're either replacing all your voxels with perfect spheres for some reason, or you want to render stuff like 3D fractals but accidentally clicked on a video about voxels without noticing it yet. For most voxel engines though, the true visual benefit of ray tracing comes in when transparency is involved. Mesh rendering doesn't draw its triangles in any particular order, and instead sorts triangles behind each other by storing the 3D depth of each pixel in a buffer and only drawing a pixel if it's in front of whatever was there first. While this works for opaque objects, the results of blending translucent objects together will vary depending on which ones were drawn first. So most mesh renderers will either risk far away translucent objects appearing in front of close ones, or only rendering the frontmost translucent object. As for ray tracing, objects will always be encountered front to back, so these kinds of problems can't happen, and the simulated light rays can even be refracted. In addition, ray tracing can render volumes instead of just surfaces, so effects like fog also become relatively easy. While mesh rendering and voxel ray tracing both have their benefits, it is important to choose which you'd prefer based on the features you'd want in your voxel engine, keeping in mind how well they may pair with how the voxel data is stored. Because calculating AABB collisions is easy, so too is colliding entities and voxels, so long as you treat each entity as an AABB when moving them in the world. The first method for this is similar to ray tracing, but you raycast the entity's box across the spaces trying to move each game tick. To perform this box cast, you just need to extend the size of each voxel being tested for collision by the size of each entity's hitbox and then do a normal raycast. The next method is less accurate, but is likely to be faster. By sliding the hitbox across each axis it moves on individually, collision can be greatly simplified. Minecraft uses this method so it can work, but as I said, it becomes really inaccurate at higher velocities. You can't get much simpler than this, apart from just checking the entity's position each tick to see if it's inside anything and moving it backwards if it is, but I would highly recommend you don't use this method, since you can literally cliff through terrain as long as you're going fast enough. Lastly, you'll need to know how voxel lighting typically works, which is often relatively simple compared to voxel storage and rendering. In games like Minecraft, a light value is stored with each voxel, which propagates to nearby voxels in each cardinal direction, decreasing light by one unit each time, though some voxels can decrease light further and others block all light entirely. For voxel games with colored lights, the red, green, and blue colors can be separated to make three light values per voxel and another light value could be added if the game has a skylight like the sun. That way, light calculation can treat skylight differently based on the time of day. When calculating which voxel receives skylight, Minecraft uses a 2D height map containing the height of the highest solid voxel, which is updated when that changes. After modifying whatever rendering code is present to darken a voxel based on its light or the light of neighboring voxels if replicating smooth lighting, the basics of the voxel engine is done. The more creative solutions may be needed if you have floating islands in your game and you don't want their shadows darkening the ground. There are, of course, many more things to add to make a playable game from your engine, so I'll briefly touch on most of them now. Entity pathfinding can be done using the A-star algorithm, checking whether an entity can see its target can be done using a raycast from the entity's eyes to that target, and entity data could be stored with an ECS, or Entity Component System, but as this isn't specific to voxel engines, I won't go into detail on how to do so here. You'll also need good world generation, which could be made using random noise, basically smooth static. 
By sampling it at each voxel, you can determine properties like the height of the terrain, the biome, or basically whatever you want. There are many variants of noise to choose from, but two popular examples are Perlin noise, which Minecraft uses for much of its terrain, or Simplet's noise, which is more efficient but less easily tileable. If you want voxels to interact with each other, like with Minecraft's liquids or redstone mechanics, you'll also need a way to know when a voxel should be updated. Since updating every loaded voxel each tick is inefficient, a good way of doing so instead is to store a list of voxel updates queued for specific ticks, which is already done in Minecraft. Then, when a voxel changes, update nearby voxels as needed. This is why floating sand can sometimes generate, which only updates and falls when a block next to it has changed. As for random updates for plant growth and decay, Minecraft has random ticks, which select a few random blocks at each chunk every tick and grow it if the block is a plant. Finally, most good voxel games have an inventory, health, and crafting mechanics, but these should be simple to add compared to everything else I've mentioned here. Now that I've covered Minecraft's current flaws, listed alternatives, and showed you how to replicate and even improve upon the technology behind it, the only thing left for me to do is to demonstrate that I know what I'm talking about by making a voxel game of my own, or I'll at least outline how I'd avoid the gameplay pitfalls Minecraft fell into in case I get too bored of making my own engine and just settle for mine test. While I'm not too bored though, or if enough people care about the project, I'll likely document the progress I've made in some later videos, where I may also reveal some details I've thought of but would be more fitting to show if and when development gets any steam. I don't want to make any promises regarding a release, even if it's likely nobody cares whether or not I finish this. With that out of the way, my technology choices for this game take heavy advantage of octrees and ray tracing, as I've always thought the prospect of massive vistas to explore sounds quite exciting, and the larger render distances would help to enable that. Because I'm using as few external libraries as reasonably possible, the game only uses port audio, Vulkan, GLFW, so Vulkan has a game window to render to, and of course a C++ standard library. While I may add libraries for stuff like networking in the future, I'll always ensure that they're compatible with at least Windows, Mac, and Linux, though most of my game testing will have to take place on Windows or Linux. To assign a main focus to the project so I don't fall into Minecraft's pitfall of trying to be everything, I'd say exploration would be the main focus. While I'd try to keep a good block palette for building or have good interactive components for people who like automation, for example, I think these gold could be secondary to having an interesting world to traverse, and motivations to traverse it. As for interesting combat, crafting, resources, and enemies, I feel these can also go in tandem with the main goal, since exploring any game's world wouldn't be very fun if it lacked obstacles to overcome or any loot to claim. As for scripting and mods, I'd like to add a good modding interface, though I can't guarantee one, since I don't have much experience with implementing one. While I've made quite a few games before, they were never public and mods are unnecessary if the only person playing a game is the one who made it. For the mechanics, I'd expect most to work similarly to Minecraft's survival mode, though a creative mode analog wouldn't be too hard to add in either. As a conclusion to this video, and a light overview of how I'll avoid modern survival shortcomings, I'll now go over each one and detail how I'd do better. With a shield, boat, or even just a sprint key, thwarting the current mobs in the game becomes trivialized in modern versions of Minecraft, and Elytra and fireworks make exploration a bit mundane when you can just fly over everything. Both problems can be solved, and already have been solved by Terraria. While it has more movement and combat tools than Minecraft, it has a few differences. First, it's 2D, so it has less movement to begin with, but this doesn't help for my game, which is going to be 3D like Minecraft. What is important is that Terraria lacks easy ways to block constant damage like Minecraft Shield, a lot of enemies can't be trapped and certainly not as easily as putting a boat in front of them, and many enemies are quite mobile as to pose more of a challenge compared to most of the mobs in Minecraft. In addition, near unlimited flight is only unlocked well after most of the map would have likely been explored, and a lot of exploration is done underground anyway. Compare this to Minecraft, where the nonlinear progression means you can get any ability relatively quickly, including near unlimited flight. Considering exploration here is presumably meant to be interesting anytime, I think a game like this would be better off reserving the ability for creative mode, even if my game may feature a lot more underground space than Minecraft has due to the lack of a strict height limit. However, stuff like grapple hooks and blast jumps should be able to enhance exploration and combat without making either too easy, especially if some bobs are mobile too. Blast jumping specifically is probably my favorite video game movement tech, since the trade-off of health means you can't just escape a combat without a price, this makes for an interesting gameplay decision. Also, it's really cool to do. As for how weapon and tool progression will likely work, I'll try to avoid direct stat upgrades as I personally find items with unique abilities way more interesting. While this is the case, I'll likely still need some direct upgrades, but there will hopefully be fewer of them than in most other games like Minecraft and Terraria. There will definitely be much less of the non-situational upgrades like most of Minecraft's enchantments, since those are semi-mandatory for having good gear in an otherwise sandbox game, and it can be annoying when you just have to do the same thing to get them each time. Though I can't guarantee I won't add these things if it turns out I'm wrong and they actually do make the game better. 
Speaking of going back on things, if it turns out a feature I add is terrible, I won't hesitate to remove it. If a feature is controversial enough to cause a version split like Minecraft had with 1.9, I have another plan. If I can find out a good way to let the game automatically download and install mods from a server like in Gary's mod, then any version differences could easily be settled with mods while the player never has to manually downgrade, which should be more convenient than trying to do this with plugins, though I'll see how it works out. Lastly, I want any progression stages of the game that are still near mandatory, such as the really early ones, to be achievable through as many means as possible. That way, gameplay can be kept fresh across multiple playthroughs. Minecraft doesn't actually have too much of a problem with this, apart from the fact that villages are both so necessary but also grant everything else, making other progression methods rather useless, but I thought I should mention it anyway. This is all the information I'll be giving now, since I want to avoid Bojang's other recent mistake of promising way too much, and talking about all the biopes and creatures I want to add before I've even finished the game engine sounds like a recipe for disappointment. I'm personally even wary of dropping a title or logo right now, though I do already have them just in case this project goes anywhere. Besides, this just means there's more details to hopefully reveal in future update videos, where I can document my projects, details about the engine's inner workings, and more information about what I'm planning to add in the future. As for now though, nice job watching this far. Hopefully you've learned something about Minecraft, its alternatives, and the technology behind it all. I know I have, just by researching for this video. Let me know whether you'd care about playing my voxel game, or even if you disagree with some of my Minecraft hot takes. Maybe try some of the other voxel games I've mentioned if you feel like it too. But most importantly, have fun. The Epic Gamer Microsoft Sam I went to the Microsoft Vietnam and then they went to the <laughs> And air support is called in Microsoft Vietnam. Oh no, it could yet come. When you default cams on the babbies but one starts screaming police bust in the door like I was like oh fun I must hide the evidence so I needed the babby out of the window but I missed and hit the funding go go lot in an epic gamer moment. One day I was a Microsoft app in the World War II and Hitler came in like 9 and he was scrolling up to the white bus to get a ballistic advance in real life.